start that and talk a little bit about what we talked about last time. Last time we talked about classical physics. And classical physics is, at least when you're talking about the classical physics of Galileo and Newton, about motion. And the way classical physics works is you must know where an object is. So if there's an object, I must locate it in space and I must know where it is, it's y and z coordinates. And if I know the forces acting on that object and how that object is moving at one point in time, classical physics allows me to calculate where that object will be at any point in the future. If I know the force on it, I know how its speed will change. If I know how its speed changes, I know where it's going to wind up. Um, so the quantities that are fundamental to classical physics are very, very small in number. You have to know where things are. So you need to know, you need to be able to measure um, distance or space. You need to know how fast they're moving, so you need to be able to measure time. This object moves one meter in 0.5 seconds. Okay? So in order to know how fast something is moving, you need a measurement of time or duration. And in order to know how much its motion is affected by the forces on it, you have to know its mass. If the object is heavy, it will be hard to change its motion. If the object is light, it will be easy to change its motion. So you need a quantity called mass. These three <coughs> measurements are the fundamental units in physics. And the unit we use in the, uh, what used to be called the metric, metric system is now called the SI system, the international system, are the meter to measure distance, the second to measure time, and the kilogram to measure mass. Why the kilogram, you say, and not the gram? It's just the way it is. Sorry. Um, the SI standard unit for mass is the kilogram. Every other thing we measure is derived from those three units. Every other quantity in physics is a derived unit whose unit is some combination of those things. For example, speed or velocity, is distance divided by time. So the unit for speed in the SI system is meters per second. We usually call this velocity. Physics. Acceleration in physics is velocity over time. How fast is your velocity changing? which is distance over time over time. It's hard to write over time. So the unit for that is a meter per second per second, which we write in physics as a meter per second squared. Per second per second, that means two seconds in the denominator. So meter per second per second is a meter per second squared. Force, according to Isaac Newton, is mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law. We talked about that briefly last time. F equals ma, mass times acceleration. So that's mass times distance over time over time. So the unit for that is a kilogram times a meter per second per second. Now eventually these get cumbersome and we get tired of writing all the units out, so we give them little nicknames. This thing is called a Newton. Named after, obviously, Sir Isaac Newton. Since he was the guy who figured out how to define force in a coherent sort of way. Um, But notice that a Newton, which is our unit of force, is not a fundamental quantity in the universe. The fundamental quantities are the mass, the 
sorry, the mass, the distance, and the time that go into measuring how much force is being exerted on something. Well, Newton is a measurement of how much something's change in distance over time is changing uh, given its mass. And all the units in the SI system are like this. Energy is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Think E equals MC squared. So it's a kilogram times a time squared, distance over time squared, which is a kilogram meter squared per second squared, which is a joule. So all of these units that we use in physics are derived from other units, except for the three <coughs> fundamental ones. You could arguably add a fourth unit to the fundamental units and say that a degree of temperature is a fundamental unit. But um, temperature is really just a measure of energy, the average energy per particle. So I would argue that temperature is actually not a fundamental unit at all. That these are the only three um, fundamental units. And in a sense, anyway, these are the quantities that are truly fundamental quantities in our universe. These are the basic building blocks of the universe we live in are space, time, and matter. Okay? So the units for distance, for time, and for mass encompass um, all the things about the universe that we can measure. Everything else is about measuring changes in those things relative to one another. Okay, velocity is a change in your location relative to time. Um, force is a change in your acceleration relative to your mass. Um, and so the three fundamental quantities are, in some sense, truly fundamental. And we'll, at the end of the course, we'll actually talk about um, describing the universe instead of, in terms of meters and seconds and kilograms, isn't if there isn't some fundamental unit of space or some fundamental unit of time or some fundamental unit of mass that is built into the universe and not just arbitrary, right? These units are arbitrary. Meters, seconds, and kilograms are just made up numbers, right? A meter is just the length of some, you know, well, it used to be the length of some metal rod under glass in France somewhere was the definition of the meter. Um, now it's defined in terms of the wavelength of certain frequencies of light so that we don't all have to go to France to check and make sure if our meter is the right length. Um, and because metal rods change size when you heat them up and cool them down and uh, little atoms eventually evaporate off the end of them and they get shorter and shorter and shorter over time, um, a metal rod under grass is not a good standard measurement because it can change over time. Um, so we try to find things to define these in terms of nowadays that are um, part of nature, not something that we just created. Um, until recently, the kilogram was defined as, uh, just defined in terms of uh, just some lump of brass that was in a museum somewhere, um, but now it's defined in terms of a certain exact number of carbon-12 molecules. So, um, But they're arbitrary. We could have picked any size thing to have been our fundamental unit of measurement or our fundamental unit. These aren't, the quantities aren't built into the universe, but the, what's, the units aren't built into the universe, but the quantities are. Space, time, and matter are fundamental, and we can choose whatever units we want to measure them in. Um, so classical physics is about measuring the trajectory of objects. And with a complete, perfect set of initial information, I know exactly where a particle is, I know exactly what the forces are that are acting on it, I can tell you exactly where that object will be at any time in the future. And we talked about the sort of implications of that last time. It leads to a strangely bleak and deterministic view of the universe. Well, I don't know if it's bleak, I guess it depends on um, how attached you are to your own interpretation of free will. But it leads to a picture of the universe in which the future is uniquely determined by the present.
We will not discuss in any great detail the philosophical implications of that idea here. Um, in the other class I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, the Science of Religion class, we will discuss the implications of that idea in great detail. Um, in other words, how did Isaac Newton reconcile the fact that he just invented a physics that was strictly deterministic and yet was a very devout, uh, not just religious person, but scholar of Christianity? Um, it turns out that there are tucked away in the Principia Mathematica statements that give us hints about what Newton saw God's role in the universe as being. Um, and it's interesting to talk about that tension between uh, the idea that, that, uh, that there are these laws of nature that determine everything that happens, and yet God has to be able to freely act in the universe and make things happen that are God's will. How can he do that without violating the laws of nature that are supposed to be saying what happens from moment to moment? Uh, it's actually a very interesting thing to talk about, but beyond the scope of this class, uh, I've probably said too much already. Um, now, there are some problems. There, there are various problems with Newtonian mechanics. It's a pretty straightforward approach to figuring out what's going on in the world. Uh, the problem is, is it's not always a very useful approach. Meaning that Newton's second law of motion that says force equals mass times acceleration is in principle enough to tell you if I know the force on any object, how it will move, how it will accelerate, how its motion will change. Um, but in practice, that's not always so easy to do. If you've got even a simple situation like um, a car on a hill, or you can think of this as a, a roller coaster car on a roller coaster, um, the forces on it are the force of gravity, which acts down, and the force of the rails of the roller coaster on the cart, which acts perpendicular to the track. Um, and there's also air resistance and there's also friction. We can usually ignore those and just pretend they don't exist. But even if we don't ignore them, if the shape of this track is anything but a straight line, and in most roller coasters it is not a straight line, it is a fairly complicated curve, that changes over time, then the direction of this force is constantly changing from moment to moment. Which means you can't just plug some number in for F and find A because this number is constantly changing. And this number is constantly changing. This is one reason you have to do things like invent calculus, which Newton did invent calculus to solve his own problems that he had made for himself. Um, because the quantities on both sides of the equation are always changing. Algebra is not cut out for that, right? Algebra and geometry are cut out for comparing static numbers on either side of an equal sign. Calculus is cut out for um, describing uh, quantities that change over time and change relative to one another. Um, so just solving a problem as simple as a car going down a curved uh, track can be complicated enough that it's very difficult to solve. Uh, it turns out that the situation is even worse when you have multiple objects involved. For example, if you take the system of the sun, the earth, and the moon. Uh, I told you last time that if I want to know where the moon is going to be in a week or a year or a hundred years, I can use um, a piece of software to calculate that. And that's true. Um, but if I wanted to do it using equations, if I want to find an equation that tells me where is the moon at any point in a week, a month, almost a month, a year, a hundred years, um, I would set up the force between the Earth and the moon, the distance between the Earth and the moon, and I'd solve those equations, uh, and I'd get an equation. Um, but I would have to do it ignoring the little tiny force that the sun exerts on the moon. Because, right? I mean, everything in the solar system exerts a force on everything else, right? Jupiter exerts a little force on the moon. But when I solve the problem, I will probably say, just pretend the sun's not there for a minute. I'll do it just with one force. If I wanted to know the orbit of the Earth around the sun, I would consider the force between the Earth and the sun and ignore the fact that the moon's always yanking the Earth around a little bit in either direction. If I tried to solve the problem considering both of these forces at the same time, okay? in other words, 
I want to figure out where the Earth and Moon are going to be at any time in the future, given their orbit around the Sun. I know the force between the Earth and the Sun, I know the force between the Earth and the Moon, I should be able to use Newton's laws to figure out how their motion changes and where they're going to be at any point in the future. Um, it turns out that that problem is impossible to solve exactly. In other words, it's impossible to get an equation that says x of the Earth is equal to some quantity that I can plug numbers into and figure out. x meaning located, well, I guess it's two-dimensional, x and y of the Earth are equal to some location. I can approximate it as closely as I want. I can say, where is the Earth going to be in 100 years to the nearest mile? to the nearest foot, to the nearest centimeter, to the nearest nanometer. Okay? But I can't get an equation that says the answer is exactly this. This is called the three-body problem. And it's not just that it's so complicated that no one's figured out how to solve it yet. It is so complicated that it has been mathematically proven that no solution exists. Okay? That's different. Right? That's different than saying we haven't figured it out yet. We've proven that it is impossible to solve. Okay? Which means that in some situations, Newton's equations are incapable of giving you an exact answer. Which means maybe they're not as useful as we thought they were. So, this is what people spent the 1700s doing sort of taking Newton's laws and stretching them to their limits and figuring out new ways of, of applying them. Um, I'll give you one more situation where, just a simple situation, where applying Newton's laws would be fairly difficult to do. If you've got a situation where where two objects just collide with one another. Let's say, in honor of the US Open, a tennis ball and a tennis racket. Okay, so I know the mass of a tennis ball, I know the mass of a tennis racket, I know it's coming at us at 95 miles per hour, I know being swung in a certain direction at 40 miles per hour. I should be able to calculate what force the racket exerts on the ball and then therefore how the ball will move. Uh, the problem is the force that's exerted on that ball is by no means constant. Um, has anybody ever seen a high-speed photograph of what happens when a tennis ball hits a tennis racket? Squishes. What squish squishes? The tennis ball squishes and what else? The 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 uh, strings of the racket actually bend inward uh, quite a bit, actually a surprising amount when you see a photograph of these things. Um, I'm not sure I can quickly find a picture of this that shows. That one doesn't do it. I got a picture of my book, but I don't remember where I found it. Um, but what happens if you look at it while it's happening is that the ball squishes and the strings bend in which means the whole process is a springy one. The force starts out small, and then gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then springs back very slowly. So the force is not, bang, the racket exerts a force on the ball. The force is, over time, the racket starts exerting a force on the ball that's small, and then it grows, and then it peaks, and then the whole thing bounces back again. The force being exerted between the two is constantly changing. This happens whenever two things come into impact. When you look for high-speed photography, you can find things like um, a golf club hitting a golf ball. When a golf club hits a golf ball, that golf ball for a few tens of milliseconds looks like that. I mean, it really does completely flatten out on one side. It really does take a finite distance over which that force is applied. Um, and 
sorry, I, think I didn't expect to talk about this, or I would have looked for some uh, pictures before class. High speed, let's search for high speed photography. Can you just get like people breaking balloons and stuff? Like in a golf ball. How do you account for spin? Um, you can account for spin if you know, for example, how fast something is spinning. And you know Bernoulli's equation for the air pressure will tell you the air pressure on this side and, the, and that side relative to the velocity of the ball. And that will tell you how much additional pressure is exerted by the air on the ball. So you just have to know more information. Uh, the point is, though, it's very, very complicated. Even if you ignore the air and pretend that the whole thing happens in a vacuum, it's very complicated because the interaction that happens between the two things takes a finite time and is very complicated when you look at it very, very closely. Using F equals MA at every instant to figure out what's the acceleration of the ball now, what is it now, what is it now, what is it now, and trying to figure out exactly how that changes the motion of the ball is actually very, very complicated. So F equals MA... Uh, is kind of a blunt instrument for figuring out what happens in, in very subtle things like this. It turns out that what people came up with in the 17 and 1800s were other tools that were better at the job. Um, one of them is something called a conservation principle or conservation law, which says that there's some number in the universe or in a system that always remains the same. For example, there's something called the law of conservation of momentum. that says the quantity that we call momentum doesn't change uh, whenever two things interact. It's always the same before and after what happens. So for example, if I know the momentum of the racket, I know its mass and its speed. Momentum is actually just mass times velocity. P is mv. Um, if I know the momentum of the racket and the momentum of the ball before the collision, the sum of the momentum after the collision has to be the same. So if I want to know what the ball is doing after the collision, uh, I can skip over the collision because the conservation principle says that this quantity will be the same. After all this complicated crap happens, okay, this number will still be the same. Okay. So there are laws that tell us that there are quantities in the universe that remain constant over time. And these quantities are um, energy, momentum, spin, uh, or angular momentum. And conservation laws allow us to skip over the interaction and get to the after part, which is usually what we're interested in anyway, and uh, thereby bypassing Newton's laws entirely. So it turns out that there are tools that are based on Newtonian physics that are useful in situations that Newton's laws are not uh, particularly useful. MV, MV, mass times velocity. So, uh, energy, momentum, and angular momentum are the big three. These are quantities that are conserved. It's interesting to ask why they're conserved. I'm not sure this is necessarily the right thing to be talking about today, but it ties in nicely with what we said about the fundamental kind of structure of the universe. Um, because we said that energy and momentum are not fundamental quantities. They're, they're combinations of other things, right? Momentum is mass times velocity. Energy is mass times velocity squared. Um, angular momentum is uh, mass times velocity times distance from the center of something that's going in a circle. Um, the way the laws came about was just that, well, they all came about kind of differently, actually. Uh, the conservation of momentum just follows from Newton's uh, second law, F equals ma. If there's no forces, that means nothing can accelerate. That means um, the total mass times velocity of the whole system has to remain the same. Conservation of energy is a weird law. Um, altogether, 
because it encompasses a lot of different things that uh, that don't seem like they're the same. Um, when you think about the word energy and how it's used, energy refers to a bunch of different things, right? Something that's moving has kinetic energy. Um, we talk about electrical energy that runs through cables. We talk about light energy and heat energy. Um, and these things seem very, very different. Um, heat and light and matter and electricity and motion seem like they're different things. But what we've figured out gradually over time is that we can account for them all with this quantity that we call energy. And if we account for them right, um, that this quantity called energy never changes. That um, energy is only transformed from one of these things to another. So we can pick any form of energy. Um, you know, if we go back to the tennis ball, and you've got the tennis ball going 120 miles per hour. Okay. That has kinetic energy because it's moving. Kinetic energy is equal to half its mass times its velocity squared. Uh, where did the energy of that tennis ball come from? How did it get that energy? From the person, from whoever hit it, right? Um, so, it was hit by a tennis racket. And somehow that person's arm had energy in it. Where did that energy come from? Yeah, it came from whatever Roger Federer had for lunch that day, right? So, okay, the energy that is stored in your muscles in the form of chemical bonds and sugars and ATP and things like that came from whatever you ate for lunch or dinner that day. Suppose you had a... Uh, a hamburger. Okay. Hopefully Roger Federer didn't have a hamburger too much. Okay. Where did the energy in that come from? How did energy get into the burger? Okay, that energy is the cow's muscular energy. That instead of being used for hitting things, is just converted into uh, our energy when we eat it. Okay? Cow energy. So, where did the cow get energy from? Why does a cow have energy in it? Okay, grass. And that grass gets its energy from where? From the sun. Okay. Where does the sun get its energy? What happens in the center of the sun? Not combustion. Nuclear fusion, right? Sun gets its energy from E equals mc squared, from converting matter into energy. That's what we'll talk about around midterm. Okay? So all of these things seem very different. The motion of a ball, the chemical bonds of an ATP molecule, uh, the sugars in uh, a blade of grass, the energy that's in the light somehow. I mean, I don't know. We don't know yet how light has energy in it, but it does. The heat of the sun, the energy of the matter of the sun. Um, and yet, if we account for how much energy, how much energy, how much energy is being used slash transformed at any of these uh, points of transition from one kind of an energy to another, we find that the total amount of energy is constant. That whatever this thing energy is, and it's apparently lots of different things, um, there's a finite amount of it, and, uh, and it's always just converted from one kind of thing to another. It's neither created nor destroyed at any point in the process. It is only transformed. This is just something we gradually discovered over time. In uh, the 1800s, uh, James Joule discovered that heat is a form of energy. In 1905, Albert Einstein discovered that matter is just a form of energy. So the process of learning that this was a law of physics was a 200 year long process. Um, but it's kind of a strange fact about the universe that there's this thing, this number called energy that's all always conserved, especially given that it seems to be such a nebulous concept um, that has these many different ways of expressing or being expressed in nature. We can ask the question, 
um, in physics, why are these things conserved? In other words, why are these particular quantities? Well, let's, let's split the question into two parts. Why are there certain quantities about the universe that are conserved? And why these particular quantities? Um, and the answer to that question kind of came about by accident um, from someone who was not a, uh, a physicist, actually. She was a mathematician named Emmy Noether. Um, who was a German? I'm pretty sure she was German, not Austrian. Um, a German mathematician working around the same time as Albert Einstein, so early 20th century, 19... I want to say she published her paper in 1912 or somewhere around that. Um, and she was just working on pure mathematics, mathematical theorems that have to do with um, symmetries. Um, and Noether's theorem is a theorem that has to do with Symmetry. Now the word symmetry is something that we kind of uh, we use in a particular way to refer to. Well, how do we use it? What do we? What do you mean when you say that something is symmetrical? Same on both sides. Like, give me an example. Okay. More or less. Right? Mm -hmm. Modulo some internal organs. Can you give me another example? Sure. You might give me one. Square. Square, that's a good one. Okay. Another one. Circle. Circle. Okay. And I'll put something a little more complicated here. There's a reason. I don't just like to draw snow from it. Um, now, what do we mean when we say those ships are symmetrical? Because they're not all symmetrical in the same way, right? What do we mean when we say that they're symmetrical? Okay. That all of them share the property that if we split them in half this way, that the sides are the same. But there are symmetries that the snowflake has that the body and the square don't have, right? What it really means to say something symmetrical, it means there's an operation I can do to it. I can do something to it, and you won't be able to tell that I did something to it, right? Like, if, uh, if these were paper cutouts, and I told you all to close your eyes, and while your eyes were closed, I flipped the little person over, and you open your eyes again, you wouldn't be able to tell that I had done anything, right? Because it is symmetrical around a rotation through its vertical axis. If this was a perfect square and it was a paper cutout, and I said, okay, close your eyes, while your eyes were closed, I could do what to it? Rotate it by how much? 90 degrees, right? If I just rotated the square 90 degrees, you wouldn't be able to tell I did anything to it. Um, that doesn't work with the person, right? If I turned the person 90 degrees and you opened your eyes, you'd be able to tell that it was on its side, but not so the square. Right? The uh, snowflake I could rotate by 60 degrees and you wouldn't be able to tell that something happened. The circle I could do what to? I could rotate it any amount I wanted. So the circle is perfectly symmetrical with respect to rotation about this axis. No matter what I did to it in this direction, you wouldn't be able to tell that anything had been done. So what a symmetry really means is that something is unchanged by some uh, I'm going to call it an operation, because that's the mathematical term. But that just means doing something to it leaves it unchanged. So what I Emmy mean, Noether discovered about mathematical systems was if there's a mathematical system that obeys a symmetry, that there is some number associated with that system that remains unchanged, that remains constant. 
There's a conserved quantity associated with that symmetry. Okay? And that's a fairly abstract idea. Okay? And I'm not even sure if I can write it out in a sentence that makes sense. Okay, if a system uh, is symmetric with respect to some operation, then there must be some conserved quantity associated with that system. For geometrical symmetries like this, the conserved quantities are things like the area of the figure or the angles of the square, right? That they don't change when you mess around with the shape. And I mean, other statement was about sort of bigger ideas in mathematics than any of us can really hope to understand at this point, things about group theory and things like that that I don't really pretend to understand myself. But physicists took that idea and applied it to the laws of physics and to Really, the universe as a whole. And Emmy's Noether is applied Emmy Noether's law or Noether's theorem as applied to physics says that if the universe or the laws of nature obey a particular symmetry, then there is a conserved quantity associated with that symmetry. What do we mean by the universe obeying a symmetry? We mean that the laws of physics themselves remain unchanged when you do certain things in the universe. For example, if we have a science lab that has a bunch of physics stuff going on in it. It's got a pendulum in it, swinging back and forth, and it's got um, it's got a light bulb connected to a battery, and it's got uh, balls rolling down ramps over here, and uh, anything else? We've got electromagnetism, we've got, uh, we'll put some laws of thermodynamics over here, we've got some ice melting in a container with a thermometer in it. And we put a physicist in this room to watch all his experiments going on. The results you will get from all your experiments do not depend on where the box is in the universe. Right? The laws of physics don't care where you are. The laws of physics are the same everywhere. They also don't care if you're moving. As long as you're moving at a constant speed. In other words, all the experiments would turn out the same in a box moving 800 miles per hour as they would in a box sitting at rest. Now, that doesn't mean that there can't be outside effects that affect what's going on inside the box, right? I mean, think about the pendulum. The swing of the pendulum depends on gravity. So if you're on the Earth, the pendulum will swing faster than if you move the box to the moon, right? That's not because the laws of physics have changed. That's because the force of gravity on the pendulum has changed. But the equations that tell you the relationship between force and acceleration haven't changed, right? The laws of physics haven't changed. You've changed the physical setup of the experiment. But there's no way to tell, for example, that you're in a box moving 800 miles per hour or sitting still or um, going half the speed of light, okay? Because the laws of physics don't care where you are and they don't care how fast you're moving. Um, this has to be true in science. If it wasn't true, uh, scientists in Europe and scientists in America would get completely different results when they did experiments because uh, the laws of physics are different in one place or another. We'd get different answers uh, to our experiments in June than we got in July because we're going around the sun and we're in a different place in the universe every six months. Um, we know that this is true about nature. We know that the laws of physics are symmetric with respect to what we call translation through space. 
and we're just moving from one place to another. This is, uh, this is one way to think about it. Um, going back to the cutouts and me moving them while you close, uh, while your eyes are closed. If tonight while we were asleep, God took everything in the universe and moved it one foot to the left, and then we woke up the next day, would there be any way to tell that anything had happened? No, right? Because a whole universe that's been moved one foot to the left looks exactly the same as it did the day before. Nothing has changed. Okay? Because space doesn't care, or I guess the laws of nature don't care about space. They don't care about where you are. What can be shown mathematically is if this is true, if the universe doesn't care that you're moving through it, then there's some number that always remains the same while you're moving through it. That number turns out to be momentum. I can't prove that to you mathematically. It's a little more sophisticated than, than we can go into right now. But the reason why momentum is conserved, the reason why there's this number that doesn't change when things are moving, is because the laws of physics don't change when things are moving. The laws of physics don't care that an object or a system is moving. There's another symmetry, and that's a symmetry with respect to time. If I do my experiments in the lab today, on Wednesday, and I do them again tomorrow, on Thursday, I'm going to get the same results. The laws of physics don't change over time. Okay? They don't change from Wednesday to Thursday. And so it doesn't matter when I do the experiment, the experiment always turns out the same. Again, barring any outside interference from things that are changing the experiment. If I was doing an experiment with how long it takes um, these ice cubes to melt, and uh, I did it at night, and then did it in the daytime, and there's sun hitting the box from the outside, heating up the room, well, of course it's going to be different. That's not because it's noon, it's because it's hotter, right? It's not the laws of the physics, the laws of physics that have changed, it's the physical conditions of the experiment. What I'm saying is the laws of physics themselves are constant over time. They do not change from one day to the next, from one century to the next, from since the time of the Big Bang, as far as we know. How can we be sure of this? Well, we can do things like we can look at the atomic spectra of light given out by stars and galaxies that are 100 million light years away, and it looks just like the, the spectrum given out from galaxies or from the hydrogen that we have in the lab. Uh, we'll actually do the experiment in a few weeks where we look at the spectrum of hydrogen. Um, the spectrum of hydrogen looks the same whether we do it today or look at sunlight that's been traveling through the galaxy for, through the universe for 100 million years. Those laws of physics, whatever they are, that determine what hydrogen looks like when you uh, heat it up and it gives off light, do not change. So the universe is symmetric with respect to time. The laws of physics themselves do not change over time. That means that there is some number in the universe that must remain the same over time. That number is the energy. Okay? The reason energy is conserved is that the laws of physics are symmetric with respect to time. They do not change over time. This one I can kind of convince you is true if I do it the other way. I can say this, if the laws of physics changed over time, that would violate the law of conservation of energy. And I'll give you a really simple example. Take uh, Newton's law of gravitation that says that the gravitational force between two objects is some number g times the mass times the mass divided by r squared. Okay? That's always true. Suppose we lived in a universe where that law was true um, uh, Monday through Sunday. Um, Twelve oh five AM midnight. 
But on Sunday, from 12 midnight, 12.04, Newton's law of gravitation was F equals 1.01 gmm over r squared. No, let's make it smaller. 0 0.99, 0 0.98 gmm over r squared. That means every Sunday night, for five minutes or so after midnight, the force of gravity is a little less. Okay? So the laws of physics change over time. Okay? This law of physics is not always the same. It changes. Now let's ignore for a minute what this would do to the orbits of the Earth and Moon every day or every week. Um, and just think about what we could do during those uh, five minutes if we um, wanted to trick the universe. What we could do is we could take something really heavy and hoist it up into the air or roll it up a hill okay, using a motor. Okay, so I use that motor to lift something heavy up into the air at 12.03 on a Sunday night. Okay, that takes a certain amount of energy. Energy depends on the force. But it takes less force to lift it up on Sunday than it does any other time. That means if Monday morning I let that weight fall again, attached instead of a motor to a generator, that the amount of energy that this falling weight gives to the generator by turning the axle was more than it took the motor to lift it. Which means if I stored that energy in a battery until next week, I'd eventually be able to run my motor for free and lift as much weight as I wanted. Now that's a stupid way to use energy, right? Just lifting weights, but then I could plug whatever the hell I wanted into this battery, right? I could charge my laptop off of it, I could plug it into a, a, a Prius and drive it around for free on the little bit of energy I get from Newton's law every Sunday at midnight, okay? So if this law of physics changed, I can sneak a little bit of energy out of it every night by using less force to lift something than that thing will give back the next morning when it falls back down. Okay, so what I've proven is the reverse of this. If the laws of physics are not symmetric with respect to time, you can violate the law of conservation of energy and get energy for nothing. Okay? Our universe doesn't work like that. You can never use a generator to run a motor uh, and not run out of energy eventually. Um, because the amount of energy is, at best, constant. You can never get any extra. But if the laws of physics changed over time, you could. So that's, in some sense, why energy is conserved. It is conserved... Oh, shoot. I don't need to erase my lab yet. It is conserved because the laws of physics are symmetric with respect to time. The laws of physics are also isotropic, meaning they're the same in every direction. If I have my lab, it's all closed up so I can't look out. And I take my whole lab and rotate it 90 degrees, the laws of physics don't change. The laws of physics are ignorant of what direction you're facing in the universe. If I measure the speed of light this way and I measure the speed of light that way, I always get the same number. Okay? That leads to the conservation of angular momentum. So the conservation of angular momentum, I'll, I'll put um, symmetry with respect to space. This is symmetry with respect to time, this is symmetry with respect to direction. Because the laws of physics don't care about direction, there is some quantity that remains unchanged when you're spinning. That quantity is your angular momentum. And the conservation of angular momentum says that the angular momentum of a spinning system or a rotating system will always remain constant. I'll give you one more that I didn't put on the list of uh, 
of conserved quantities before, because it's a little bit trickier. Um, when you think about electricity, how much electricity flows from one thing to another depends on something called the voltage. And the difference between a 9 volt battery and 120 volts that comes out of the wall is that the electrons are coming out of the wall with more energy um, per electron or per, per electrical charge than a 9 volt battery. Um, so you can take something like a 9 volt battery and you can stick it to your tongue and get a little electrical shock but not get terribly electrocuted. Because 9 volts is not a whole lot of energy. Uh, so if I want to put my tongue on a 9 volt battery, uh, I am free to do so. Um, so the difference in voltage between the plus terminal um, and the minus terminal is 9 volts. Uh, if instead of a 9 volt battery, I took uh, a wire and connected one to a plug that was 1 million volts, and one that was one million and nine volts, and took those wires and stuck them to my tongue, the effect would be exactly the same. Okay? The difference in voltage determines how much the electrons want to get from this thing to that thing. Right? The electrons don't care um, what the voltage is, they care what the difference in voltage is. Uh, which is why, for example, you can hang from a high voltage power line that's 10,000 volts and not get electrocuted until your foot touches the ground or until someone tries to grab you, right? Because then the difference in voltage between you is between the 10,000 volt and the zero volts of the ground, okay? So it's differences in voltage that, um, that matter, not voltages. And this is called symmetry with respect to, this is sometimes called it gauge or where you consider the zero of voltage. The way to think about this one is, if while we're asleep tonight, God connected everything in the universe to a million volt battery, right? When we woke up the next day, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. We wouldn't be able to tell anything that happened because the electrical potential of everything went up by a million volts. But the differences between electrical potential of everything are still the same. Um, symmetry with respect to gauge leads to a conservation of a quantity called electrical charge. Okay, the amount of electrical charge in the universe is constant. You cannot just create a bunch of negative electrical charges. And that is a result of symmetry with respect to um, choice of zero gauge or zero potential. That one's a little bit more vague. But the interesting thing for our purposes is that the laws of physics, these conservation laws that we've discovered piecemeal since, uh, since say, 1700, are consequences of the properties of our universe and the laws of nature that describe the universe. There's reasons why the laws of physics are true. One of the things we'll get to by the end of the course is a modern approach to physics, which instead of going this way, of saying we know momentum is conserved, why is it conserved? We know charge is conserved, why is it conserved? Going the other way. Modern particle physics physicists will often postulate maybe the universe is symmetric with respect to this thing. What law of physics would that result in? And can we go look in a particle accelerator and see if that law of physics is true. So it's turning the whole process of physics upside down from what it has been from, say, 1700 to 1960 or so. Um, instead of identifying which symmetries lead to which laws of physics, it's trying to find the laws of physics by looking for symmetries at the atomic level with respect to things like, well, I can't even, the words won't even make any sense to you now until we talk about particle physics, but um, by considering subatomic particles as obeying certain symmetries, we can deduce that there are certain quantities that will be conserved when they do whatever it is that those subatomic particles um, do. So that is a peek ahead at where we eventually want to be. We eventually want to be to the place where not only have we figured out what the laws of nature are, 
we eventually want to be to a place where we can figure out why those laws of nature are what they are instead of something else entirely. Okay? That whole 20 minutes was a bit of a tangent. <laughs> but it's an important tangent because it, it puts a kind of goalpost out for the end of the course. Um, and it shows us that underneath classical physics, which is a fairly boring endeavor, I mean, the reason I think that most of you people are in this class and not my class that's at 2 o'clock, Constructing the Laws of Nature, is that, you know, these classical physics courses that are about balls rolling down ramps just don't seem that interesting. And solving problems using the conservation of momentum and conservation of energy, while it might be useful if you eventually intend to major in physics, is not particularly exciting. But, I think it's important to recognize that behind these very simple laws of classical physics, there's some very sophisticated ideas about the way the universe works. And this connection between conservation and symmetry is one of those um, modern ideas about uh, the laws of physics that will become very, very important as we move on through the course and get to um, the structure of matter at the fundamental level where we are really asking um, what are the reasons why matter behaves the way it does and what are the things that matter is allowed to do and not allowed to do. So that will be uh, really the last probably three weeks or so, of course, these ideas will come back um, full force and inform the discussion that we have then. In the meantime, we've got these conservation laws, we've got definitions of mass, distance, and time, and we've got a plan for figuring out what happens in nature by figuring out how things are moving and determining what forces are acting between things in nature. And I said last time that Newton tells us that if universe is just a bunch of atoms and they're exerting forces on one another, we know that their energy is conserved, we know that their momentum is conserved, we know that their acceleration is given by the force divided by the mass, we can always figure out what these things will do. Um, and we said that Albert Einstein, in his review of physics that he wrote in the 20s called um, The Evolution of Physics, referred to this uh, program set out by Newton as the rise of the mechanical view. The universe is just a mechanism made up of little atoms. We figure out what the atoms do. We're done. Uh, the unfortunate follow-up, though, to Newton is that the more people studied the more subtle things that go on in nature, the more ideas they came up with that didn't fit into the mechanical view at all. Um, they were ideas that revolved around these sort of mysterious, invisible substances uh, that explained the things that happened in nature. For example, when Benjamin Franklin was, was uh, messing around with electricity, um, electrically charging up metal doodads and flying kites and thunderstorms and whatever the hell Benjamin Franklin was up to. Um, he came up with the, what we refer to today as positive and negative electrical charge. Um, but he didn't know what that meant. Um, to Franklin, positive and negative electrical charges were, or positive and negative electrical charge was the presence of, or absence of some substance, some what he referred to as an electrical fluid. So if I take a balloon and I rub it on my head, what I'm doing is I'm rubbing some electrical fluid out of my hair onto the balloon, onto the balloon leaving my hair with a, a deficit, so negative, Electric, less than it should have electrical fluid, and the balloon with a surplus of electrical fluid. And the properties of this electrical fluid was that, um, and now I'm not sure if Franklin had a two fluid model or not. There were two, two different models of electricity. One was it was just the presence and absence of one kind of thing. The other model was that there are two kinds of electrical fluid that, that you could have either more or less of. Um, Whatever the case, this electrical fluid was invisible, it had no weight, you could only detect it by its, proper, by its uh, 
the forces that are exerted on things. The same sort of thing was thought about heat in the early part of the 1700s. Um, if you ask what heat is, I mean, I've got a, a mug of tea that I brought into class at the beginning. At the beginning of class, that was maybe um, I don't know, probably about 100 degrees, um, say 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. By the end of class, it's probably about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? What happened to it? What What is different about the tea now than uh, it was before? Well, the heat has left it right? and somehow entered the room. The room's a little warmer now. The tea's a little cooler. What is that? What is the heat? Yeah, not warmer enough, right? Um, <laughs> In the 1700s, the heat was thought of as a stuff, a thing, a kind of material called caloric. The word calorie, which is our unit for energy and also for food energy, was thought of as a kind of stuff that the cup started out with a lot of, and gradually that caloric kind of leaked down into the room, leaving the cup with less caloric. So this caloric fluid was thought to be a substance in and of itself. What are the properties of caloric fluid? It's invisible, it's massless, uh, it's indivisible uh, into pieces. There are no atoms of caloric. It is a uh, continuous substance. And you can't see it, but you can feel its effects. Um, Oh my god. <laughs> that is just great. Sometimes it, sometimes it stops. Alright, well. The lights are still blinking now. Good stop. I think we, I mean. No, I think they mean it. Um, this is not the greatest place to stop, but it is a possible place to stop. I mean, we only had 10 minutes left anyway. Um, uh, let me tell you if I think you should read chapter 2. I wish the alarm were more convincing. <laughs> yeah, read. Definitely read chapter two before next time. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think I do have change actually. Because someone else, someone else made change for. You get forty, I'll give you fifty. Oh, you have a fifty? That I can do. I have one with the cover, the one without a cover. Inside, they're the same. Yep.